a story based on true events about Ford Motor Company's victorious win against its competitor Ferrari with the help of two racing legends. What is the secret behind this historical success? The movie begins with Carroll Shelby reminiscing the moment he victoriously won the Le Mans in 1959. However, he snaps out of his trip to memory lane when the doctor calls out his name and reminds him to take his heart condition seriously and retire early from pro racing. Carroll insists there are races he can still join, but the doctor insists that he shouldn't and enumerates all the risks to his health and his life. He leaves the clinic and downs the pills out of frustration because he has no other choice but to leave the pro racing scene for good officially. Meanwhile, Ken Miles, a car mechanic, is advising a customer on the proper maintenance of his car while his son Peter is playing by himself. The customer gets offended by Ken's arrogance, curses at him, and drives off angrily while Peter laughs at his father's antics. You'd think that would ruin his day, but Ken seems unfazed. Instead, his day gets better when his beautiful wife, Molly, visits him at work. Elsewhere, a fuming Henry Ford II storms inside their company's factory. He announces to everyone that whoever gives him the best idea to boost their car sales keeps their job, and those who couldn't are officially unemployed. Carol, who's officially retired from his pro racing career, begins a new career as an automotive designer and the owner of Shelby American, his garage. Phil, his colleague, wakes him up and hurries him to get on with their day. At the same place, a race car marshal informs Kent that he's disqualified because his car doesn't fit the standards prescribed. Due to his hot-tempered nature, Ken argues with the marshal and defends his right to have a slot in the competition. On the other hand, Carol is trying to introduce him and market his skills to a Porsche representative currently searching for a new race driver. Here, the Porsche representative doesn't want to hire Ken because of rumors that he's a difficult person to deal with. And yes, he is. But Carol thinks he doesn't know that, so why not try to make it work? However, all his efforts went down the drain when Ken makes the scene and unknowingly proves the rumors about his stuck-up behavior and hot-headedness. The Porsche representative walks away and immediately throws out the idea of hiring him. Realizing the opportunity they just lost, Carol calls Ken out for his behavior and reminds him that he needs a sponsor if he wants to become a pro race car driver. Ken gets upset and throws a wrench at Carol. Luckily, Carol was able to dodge, but his car couldn't. Ken is having a bad day because of Carol's reality check and his beaten up car. Still, he joins the competition and is determined to win because his son is among the audience and he wants to make him proud. The race officially starts and Carol still watches over him despite being disappointed with his behavior. Despite having a rocky start and getting ridiculed for his car's busted tongue and appearance, Ken wins the 40 laps race. Ken couldn't help but feel like he was on top of the world, especially after hearing everyone's cheers and seeing his son incredibly proud of him. However, this happiness didn't last very long. Upon returning home, he discovers that IRS locked up their garage and seized everything inside. Molly is worried about their financial situation, but Ken assures them that they will get through this. In the Ford headquarters, Lee, one of the executives, proposes to venture into designing and developing racing cars. The company executives, including Henry Ford himself, are interested at first, but after one minor technical issue, they begin to question Lee's plan and even his credibility as a leader of the marketing team. Seeing that a simple slide presentation will not work, Lee he drops the truth bomb on everyone. He begins that Enzo Ferrari will go down as the best car manufacturer in history because of what his racing cars mean to the public. He adds that winning the Le Mans races, which was Ferrari's expertise during those times, is the marketing strategy they need to boost car sales. When he sees that Henry's finally interested again, Lee reveals that Ferrari is facing bankruptcy. After hearing this, Henry gives him the go signal to purchase shares from Ferrari. Meanwhile, Ken tells Molly that he will be quitting racing to begin a day job. He adds that he thinks it's too late for him to become a rising star in pro racing because of his age. Peter couldn't help but feel disappointed after hearing this decision. Lee finally heads to the Ferrari headquarters and meets with Enzo himself to explain the proposal, which is to merge the two companies as Ford Ferrari. Their company will have 90% control over the production while Ferrari will have 90% control over the racing. Lee excitedly waits for Enzo to sign the papers, but Enzo asks for time to read the agreement. While waiting, Enzo's men went behind their backs to meet with another buyer. Unbeknownst to this, Lee patiently waits for Enzo to finish reading only to hear him reject the proposal and blatantly badmouth Henry Ford II and his company using his mother tongue, Italian. 
To make things worse, they discover that Enzo played them by upping his price and selling his company to Fiat, another car manufacturing company. Back at the headquarters, Lee reluctantly reveals that Enzo said Henry could never live up to his grandfather's legacy. With this provocation, Henry orders Lee to find the best engineers and the best drivers to build the racing car that will defeat Ferrari at Le Mans. Since Carroll is one of the few Americans to win the Le Mans, Lee heads to his garage to ask what it will take for Ford to win this race. Carroll becomes honest enough to admit that it's not just tricky, but an incredibly stressful and tiring experience for both the driver and the car. Carroll believes Ford doesn't have what it takes, but after hearing Henry is ready to give a blank check for the expenses, he accepts the deal and heads to the best racer he's ever known, Ken. After hearing the proposition, Ken couldn't help but laugh at him as if he heard the most absurd thing in the world. But seeing that he's not convinced, he invites him to Ford's Mustang event to listen to his speech and maybe change his mind. Ken brings Peter to the event, but he cannot help but run his mouth and insult the new release right to Leo's face, the senior vice president of Ford. Just when they're about to leave, Carol finally arrives gracefully, which prompts Ken to stay and listen to his speech. However, he gets disappointed after hearing Carol buttering up Henry Ford and thinks his proposition is not worth his time. Luckily, this is just part of Carol's plan who personally visits him at his house later that night to show him Ford's latest prototype of the car that they want to head up against Ferrari. Carol seems to know how to push the right buttons. It lets Ken drive the prototype, and despite it being the most awful car that Ken has ever seen, he couldn't help but feel drawn to it and enjoy its exhilarating speed. So after getting Molly's approval to return to racing, Ken finally accepts the job offer. The process works like this. Ken drives the prototype while Carol's team watches him and identifies the area for development. Since Ken is a mechanic himself, he also provides his input. One day, Leo suggests hiring another driver and eliminating Ken from the team because his demeanor doesn't fit Ford's image. Carol disagrees and insists that Ken is the best for the job, but Leo is adamant about hiring a driver that will do well with their marketing. Since Carol wants to appease their money provider, he informs Ken that he'll no longer drive in the race. Instead of cursing him out, Ken, who's visibly upset, only walks away. Ultimately, Ford loses the races and even breaks most of its prototypes. Carol gets summoned to the main headquarters where he finally meets Henry Ford himself. Henry begins by telling Carol to convince him why he shouldn't fire him and his team. Carol, on the other hand, instead of giving reasons, mentions that he only needs one man to be in charge of the racing cars instead of having a whole committee behind it. He also adds that despite losing the race, Enzo will probably feel threatened that they have made something that can go fast than his cars. Henry gets satisfied with this answer and gives him full authority over the racing program. Of course, he first brings Ken back to the team. Ken is the only one who noticed what was wrong with the prototype and Carol still believes he's the best racer to drive for Ford. Ken, who is still upset with him, punches him in the face to get him back. Carol gets upset and also throws a punch. While the two are going at each other's throats at the side of the street, Molly only watches from their backyard, amused by their childish antics. Just like teenage boys, the two reconcile after beating each other up to release their frustrations. This is not a recommended method for everyone though. Maybe just talk it out like, uh, not these psychos right here, huh? With this, Ken is officially back on the team. After numerous trials and errors, test runs and modification, Ken gets into an accident that lights up the entire car. While he survives, the team becomes frantic as they cannot seem to perfect the car. Carol, on the other hand, has problems on his own when Leo reacquires full authority over the racing program and is hell-bent to eliminate Ken from the team. The next day, Henry and his executives visit their garage to check on the car. Carol locks Leo in his office and takes Henry on a test drive to show him what they have done so far. Henry couldn't help but saw because he was proud to see how far they come. While vulnerable, Carol takes this opportunity to advise Ken again as the best man to drive the car. At first, Henry is still reluctant to agree, so Carol takes a risk by saying if Ken can't bring them to Le Mans, Ford Motor Company will have full ownership over his garage. In the next scene, we see Ken driving the car in the Daytona race, which means Henry agrees to Carol's proposition. Leo also enters a driver of his own using the same car that Ken's driving to challenge Carol. To him, this is all about his pride. Luckily, Carol is not the type of person who backs down easily from a challenge. By the time they reach the 23rd hour of the race, Carol gives Ken the pass to drive the car at a crazy RPM of 7,000. With this, Ken wins the race and earns Ford Motor Company a spot in Le Mans. The race at Le Mans finally starts, but Ken is unlucky to start with a faulty door during the first lap. Once he finishes the lap, 
Carol's team hammers the door close. With that, Ken finally gives all that he's got and races after his main competition, Lorenzo Bandini, Ferrari's racer. He even sets new lap records in the process, gaining applause from the crowd. The night came and Lorenzo remains in first place. While Ken is catching up to him, the rain starts to pour. Ken suffers from a brake fade, so Carol's team replaces the entire braking system. Ferrari's team appeals to the organizers, but Carol argues that their rule doesn't specifically prohibit this. The morning finally comes and Ferrari's remaining representative blows his engine. With that, Ford dominates the top three positions. When Henry arrives, Leo proposes a ridiculous plan which is one again for publicity, to have all the Fords finish at the same time even if Miles is laps ahead of the rest of them. As expected of marketing teams of business companies, very disappointing but not surprising. Carol is also disappointed with this but still relays this order to Ken. At first, Ken continues to set lap records but slows down on the final laps, letting the other Ford racers catch up to him. By the end of the race, Ken was declared second place since the other Ford racer started further than him. Carol protests and even accuses Leo that this is his plan all along. At first, Ken is disappointed but when he sees Enzo tipping off his hat to him, he accepts it because nothing sweeter than gaining the respect of your competition. While Carol is apologetic about the turn of events, Ken only tells him that they'll win the next Le Mans race. Unfortunately, Ken never got to join the next year's race. Two months after the race, Ken dies from a car crash after testing one of Ford's newest prototypes. Six months have passed after Ken's death and Carol still couldn't find peace within himself. He tries to visit Molly but is reluctant as he's still guilty about what happened. Instead, he gives the wrench that Ken threw at him to his son Peter as he finally cries out his pent-up guilt. The movie ends with Ken getting inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame in America and the car they made gave Ford a winning streak from 1967 to 1969 in Le Mans. This remains to be the only American car to ever win in that race. If you like movies that reference real-life events and seeing the underdog prevail at the end, well, this movie's for you. Well, sure things didn't end so well, but it's nice to see that Ken is still winning in the afterlife, isn't it? Make sure to gather your friends and family with this one, because you'll surely enjoy the perfect performance of the actors and fascinating story behind Ford's success. Please subscribe to our channel to be notified when we upload. Also, let us know what movies you'd like us to recap in the future in the comments down below.